the, the next theme that we have here in these gentlemen handbooks. Exercise for education. Physical education complemented the academic pursuits of many young Scottish courtiers and gentlemen and was interwoven in their daily life. Exercise was conceptualized in many different ways and thus, and thus served many different purposes. Um, and so I'll talk about sports here and what they were doing in terms of their education. It demonstrates, this, this section, it demonstrates that despite the north of Scotland being geographically distant from Europe, Edinburgh, and England, the physical culture found in the gentlemen's handbooks was practiced to a great success and produced sporting and exercise habits that mirrored those to the south, although they did have their own characteristics. As Keith M. Brown has argued in the early 17th century, the Scottish nobility were influenced by the works of Castellone and Ascham. Enmeshed within this courtly culture, Sir Robert advised his pupil on the most fashionable and appropriate athletic pursuits. Gordon, himself a sportsman, when he travelled to France in his youth where he studied civil law, he has said in his own words, to have practised in all exercises fit for a gentleman of his birth and quality. He was particularly adept at archery, winning a silver arrow in 17, 1617, during King James VI's visit to Edinburgh. It is likely that Gordon was also a, an accomplished horseman, fencer and dancer, and no doubt a golfer, being born at Dunrobin and being educated in Dornoch. Um, Gordon was obviously influenced by his courtly culture and his extensive reading of pedagogical manuals, and he therefore instructed John to let your bodily exercise be running, leaping, fencing, wrestling, dancing, playing at tennis, archery, tilting at the ring, hawking, and hunting, which is a martial sport and resembleth the wars much, for it maketh a man hardy and skillful in all grounds. The encouragement of these exercises, taken nearly verbatim from the Basilican Dorn, demonstrates the House of Sutherland's involvement in European trends, as this list could have been easily drafted for a nobleman of England, France, or Spain. Moreover, it dismisses any assumptions of athletic parochialism in the Northern Scottish elite at this time. Additionally, golf was held in high esteem by Gordon, as the expenses of the Earl show that he enjoyed the Lynx game, as well as Archer while school in Dordic, as well as the University in St. Andrews, where he played alongside the Earl of Montrose. Although sport in this region was not just an elite preserve, exercises such as tennis, tilting and hawking were reserved for the wealthy. Golf, archery and riding were for everyone, although especially in Dornoch, as Gordon wrote, about this town there are the fairest and largest links of any part of Scotland fit for archery, golfing, riding and all other exercises, and they do surpass the fields of Montrose and St. Andrews. Similarly to James VI, discouraged football as a subversive game, although enjoyed by both elite and commoner. The chastisement was based on the perception and the reality that it was a riotous affair and caused great damage and disruption to communities. Gordon's low opinion of the sport could have related to um, a, a jab poked at his family's family rivals, the Sinclairs of Caithness, relating to their barbaric behaviour at a wedding match in the late 16th century, where George, the fifth Earl of Caithness, killed two of his kinsmen, David and Ingram Sinclair, in cold blood during a match, uh, pulling out a sword, stabbing one, then shooting the other one. Um, he believed that they were actually loyal to the, the House of Sutherland, not to Caithness, so he dispatched them rather quickly. Although it was rather sad because it was the one's, his daughter's wedding. <laughs> not a very good, uh, yeah, ooh, heavy day. Um, other po another possible reason why Gordon didn't like football was the memory of a family member of his, the 5th Earl of Huntley, dying from a stroke during enthusiastic play in 1576. Therefore, Gordon wished that the Earl to abstain from this sport and instead take up practices appropriate for his position. For the common man, Martial exercises alongside an education were vital for their future vocations, as well as their duty to the Earl. Gordon believed that sport benefited the common man, and alongside English language education, he urged John to cherish your countrymen and train them up in all kind of honest exercise, such as hunting, riding, archery, shooting with the gun, golfing, jumping, running, swimming, and such like. So we can see here from a very this was in um, 1620. From an early, early time, golf was a, a sub, very supported sport for 
everybody. It wasn't just a sport for the elite. The elite. And then, although um, in the 18th century, fewer records of the everyday person are playing, um, it does stay as a sport for everybody in Scotland. Um, John must have internalized much of his uncle's advice. Throughout the po political and religious turmoil of the 1640s and 50s, he continued to support sport and education, values he bestowed upon his sons, who then, in turn, continued the tradition. Little is known of the education of the Earl's two sons, George and Robert, but probably like their father, they were educated in Doric before attending university. The young men travelled to London for two years, between 1654 and 1656, and enjoyed polite society. Uh, probably living in Westminster, we're not quite sure. Uh, at this time, the Earl was buried in debt, and he bemoaned his son's lavish expenses, writing, if I were always so exorbitant in my spending as they are, I would be called the destroyer of my house. The records illuminate the everyday life of these two young nobles out in the town in London uh, for expenses for sightseeing, clothing, books, entertainment, and sports, including wagers lost at uh, golfing and bowls. While in the city, they continued their studies with French and mathematics. While away from home, they also maintained connection with their elderly uncle, Sir Robert. Arkart too considered corporeal, corporal education as vocational and important for the building of the courtier and the gentleman. As Wolfgang Berenger demonstrates, contemporary universities in Europe had long attracted pupils with sports masters. And it seems like Arkart was trying to do the same. For his university, he wrote, I had also procured the residence of men of prime faculties for bodily exercise, such as riding, fencing, dancing, military feats of mustering and battling, handling of the pike and musket, the art of gunnery, fortifications, or anything that belong to the wars belongeth either to defense or assault, vaulting, swimming, throwing the bar, playing tennis, singing, fingering of all manner of inst musical instruments, hawking, hunting, fowling, angling, shooting, whatever may conduce, to the accomplishment of either the body or the mind, enriching men in their fortunes, or promoting them to deserve it honors. Um, so he was definitely very ambitious with his, um, his university, um, going with his kind of lavish character. Um, Urquhart's impressive initiative reflected his ambitions to educate gentlemen and courtiers. His list of exercises also illuminates that imposing modern categorizations on elite 17th century exercises would be an anachronism if, done, if not done carefully, as Urquhart provided only vague indication or differentiation um, between particular activities, switching back and forth from martial and civilian exercises and artistic pursuits. This was also characteristic of the gentleman's handbook in the 17th century. This demonstrates the importance of the versatility of courtiers and gentlemen as they add to easily shift from worlds of violent hand-to-hand -hand fighting, fortifications and musketry, to another of playing tennis, singing and playing musical instruments, and then back to hunting, fishing and hawking. In the 18th century, physical education of the northern elite re remained relatively unchanged. However, technological changes on the battlefield meant that many of the antiquated chivalric martial exercises fell into disuse. Exercises that did continue included angling, archery, badminton, bowls, billiards, fencing, fouling, golfing, hunting, hawking, riding, and tennis. John Locke's Some Thoughts Concerning Education, written in 1694, remained a popular text throughout this period. This gentleman with the fantastic hair, James Ogilvy, the fourth Earl of Finlader and first of Seafield, owned two copies of Locke's work in uh, in his library by 6, 1709, um, his house being in Cullen. Um, he was a proponent of sport and quite a sportsman himself, as him and his brother were keen golfers and archers while at school in Aberdeen. In adulthood, Ogilvy um, integrated sport into his son's education. Specifically, he wanted Lord Deskford to play golf, purchasing golf clubs and golf balls, having them shipped from Edinburgh and Aberdeen to his house in Cullen. Likewise, the Duke of Gordon in 1719 owned another two copies of Locke's text, and he too was a patron of sport. His preferred pastime was horse racing. Um, 
Fordyce supported many exercises, but argued they were actually secondary to they were secondary to academics, and they were only to be done if they were innocent amusements. His scant references or explanations to corporal education demonstrate a popular perception among the affluent in the 18th century that looked down on physical labor and exercise, indicating a possible change in the value of physical education in the mid 18th century. This move away from physical activities was the focus of Buckingham's perhaps overly critical condemnation of sedentary lifestyles of the affluent in the 18th century. Uh, this is part of Buckingham's chastisement of the sedentary lifestyle. Um, quite uh, resonated with me. Intense thinking is so destructive to health that few instances can be produced of studious persons who are strong and healthy. Hard study always implies a sedentary life. And, when intense thinking is joined with the want of exercise, the consequences must be bad. Perpetual thinkers, as they are called, seldom think long. In a few years, they generally become quite stupid and exhibit a melancholy proof of their how readily the greatest blessing may be abused. Um, so that's why I've been taking up running half marathons. Um, so to contrast... Um, Fordyce's opinion of lack of that physical education wasn't all that important. Um, Sir William Forbes believed that many exercises were appropriate for his sons in, in the 18th century. He argued that regulated exercise was essential for their education and was directly influenced by Locke's theory that it was both ed physical education and academic study was important to keep uh, young students happily engaged. If they got bored with one, go tell them to go do something else. So, um, but he didn't want the young pupils to become obsessed with sport. So if he found them getting obsessed with sport, he'd just tell them to keep playing that sport and playing that sport till they just got tired and sick of it and went back in and read their books. Uh, so he was trying to have a balance and show them that you can get sick of things um, and you should try to keep a balanced lifestyle. Uh, at the grammar school, Forbes insisted that his sons take intervals of leisure which should be devoted to the manly exercises of fencing, dancing, and walking. Interesting walking in there, we don't really think about that as much of a manly exercise. I, I don't know. He wanted them to be active anyway. Um, Forbes drawing explicitly on Locke also supported swimming. Uh, curiously, and unlike others mentioned before, Forbes is a large proponent of skating for its health benefits and its practicality as an inexpensive mode of winter transportation. Um, maybe that's him being a bit of a, a, a tight-fisted banker, I, I'm not sure, but he definitely wanted his sons out skating. And it's also likely that he would have supported the other Scottish sports, such as curling and golf. Um, he being a founding member of the Fraserburgh Golf Club, and in his personal records are I believe the only records of the golf club. He was um, quite important in the club. Forbes half-heartedly supported field sports and angling, however. Although they are conducive to health, he was aware that they were not for everyone. And he wrote to his sons, I shall not be displeased if you possess a tenderness of feeling, as well as a sense of propriety that shall prevent you joining in the wanton and indiscriminate slaughter of dumb creatures. Forbes' awareness of blood sports were not enjoyed, with it, enjoyed by everyone coincided with a gradual ideological change in the late 18th and early 19th centuries in Britain, especially seen in relation to popular sports, where violence against men or animals was not equated to enjoyment. In general, the Scottish Kirk had long discouraged cruelty to animals in sport, um, and as a result had cockfighting dog fighting, bull baiting, bear baiting, all have a relatively silent and underground history in Scotland in comparison to that of England. That is not to say that English, English evangelicals had not attempted similar discouragements, but they are later in the 18th century. Um, these kind of, this feeling of uh, animal protection was one of the prime movers in the founding of the RSPCA. Um, 